Hey everyone, Ryan Young, Kama Jiu Jitsu. I hope you're doing well. If you looked at a lot of our videos, especially the ones that talk about Gracie family members, you'll see a lot of banter going back and forth about who's the best and this person would have beat this person and so on and so forth. A lot of it is academic and the reason is because you, you span generations, right? Carson to Halls, one generation. Halls to Hickson, not really a generation because they're only about seven or so years apart, but it might as well be a generation in, in what their abilities were at different points in time. And then you have um, Hickson to Hiron Gracie or Hickson to Halls, uh, Hodger Gracie, right? Another generation. Or even Crone, you put all those guys in. People like to say, oh, well, Halls would have beat Hickson or Hickson would have beat Halls and Hodger would have beat them all and Higa Machado was, was you know, able to beat certain people. And like I said, it, it, it's kind of academic. It doesn't really matter at this point, but it's always fun to talk about. Here's a way that I like to look at things because in my mind, and when you, you all know this already, in my mind, the greatest jujitsu practitioner of all time is Hicks and Gracie, They're bar none. And what makes him that? You could say that Hodger might be able to beat Hickson. So you get two of them in their prime, Hodger might be able to beat Hickson. Why? Will he beat him because of technique? I seriously doubt it. Hodger is extremely technical, but would he be able to out-technique Hickson? I really don't think so. Where Hodger would beat Hickson is in the fact that Hodger is like 6'4", right? He's a big dude. Probably you know, maybe 205, 220 pounds. I have no idea. But I know he's probably over 200 pounds and he's probably about 6'5". Hickson, in his prime, 5'9", about 190 pounds, right? So you're talking a huge size difference. And secret formula of jiu-jitsu again, your overall game is the sum of your physicality plus your technique. The real question is, given Hodger's technique, does his physicality give him enough of a boost to beat Hickson's some of his physicality and technique. I don't know. So where I like to look at it, when I like to compare people that have influenced my jiu-jitsu, as well as many of your, your games as well, what I like to look at is the innovations that that particular person has done, right? You might have champion X that just beats everyone. You know, they can't beat anyone. On the other hand, you have Another person who may not even be a champion, who doesn't ever beat this champion, but has created other people that have done better or has influenced other people to a huge degree that might create another champion that would rival this other champion. Look at it this way. Um, I like to use a lot of football coach references, right? Because it really makes sense. So you have some players that become coaches, but are they Super Bowl winning coaches, right? Um, they may have been very good in their day playing football, but when they make the transition to coaching, are they any good? On the other hand, you have those coaches who truly innovate in football and they're able to create these new offensive schemes or defensive schemes. Um, they're able to develop players even though they may not have been the best, but they have the, in, the innovative abilities and the mindset to be able to make the sport bigger than what they are. And they're able to make the sport better than when they found it. So just like with football, it also happens with jujitsu. You have people who are champions. They're, they're known as among the greatest that have ever practiced the game. But are they innovators? Did they take what they were taught and effectively use it or did they actually create something or did they take an idea and then expand it out to the point that nobody has ever seen before. Being a champion is one thing, right? Like being an athlete is one thing. Being a coach or being even, even an athlete that innovates is different. So in my mind, you have some, some big innovators in jiu-jitsu. So I think Elio was a pretty good innovator in jiu-jitsu. May not have been the best. A lot of people like to say George Gracie, his brother, was the best one. But I think Elio was probably a better innovator. 
if you look at the next generation down, Carson Gracie. Carson Gracie was a phenomenal champion for the family. But he was also an innovator in that he brought the street fight version of jiu-jitsu to the forefront at the time. I think he was one of the very first to fight without a gi on. Whereas prior to him, his uncles and his father, you know, outside of a, a, an, an all-out street fight, they always, they always fought with the gis on. Whereas Carson would do it with and without. So being that Carlson was the oldest of Carlos Gracie's sons, he had a number of brothers that did jiu-jitsu after him that were not necessarily innovators. You don't hear of some of his brothers with regard to innovation until Halls comes around. So Halls is several brothers down. I'd say he probably, at that point, Halls probably has maybe seven older brothers. Halls innovated the jiu-jitsu where he would bring in wrestling concepts, um, you know, and he undoubtedly take, took what Carson did and then added his own flair to it. And to the point where Halls is probably the biggest, one of the, the, one of the biggest influences of modern jiu-jitsu, right? Um, he opened the playbook, so to speak, by bringing in other concepts from other grappling arts that worked for, for him. And as a result, Jiu-Jitsu after him was different than Jiu-Jitsu before him. So he's a big innovator. And then you had, you had all Elio's sons and you had more of Carlos Sr.'s sons. But the next innovator after him is Hickson, right? Hickson has taken Jiu-Jitsu to levels that nobody has ever seen. And also to levels that most people have never seen. And the reason is because Hickson didn't teach a ton of people firsthand uh, you know, other than maybe a seminar here or a visit over there, teach some privates, and then he'd be on his way. He had an academy, and it was a very small academy. It never really got very large. And when he did have an academy, he was still in his prime, and he was doing a lot of fighting. When I was at Hickson's Academy, he used to teach every class up until a certain point, until Valley Tudo, I think it was, I don't know, 90, 95, 96, 97, one of those. And then... He was in during the day usually to train, to get, get himself ready for a fight, but he often wouldn't be in the night classes and then I didn't see him around. But that doesn't mean he wasn't innovating because he was always looking for a way to make things better. So as an example, you know, Dave, Dave Kama and I talk, would talk about this, how when he sees Hickson, Hickson always has a little twist to something that Dave's been doing for years. And the rationale is this. Let's say it takes 100 pounds of pressure to choke somebody out doing a certain technique. Well, that's not good enough. Hickson goes, okay, so if it, took, if it took 100 pounds of pressure to do it, how do I do the same choke? What adjustments do I need to make to accomplish that in 50 pounds? So he'll work and work and work and work and think about it and figure it out. Oh, you know, if I, if I simply move my pinky here, now I only need to use 50 pounds of pressure. Okay, so then, 50 pounds of pressure, now he's doing it with half the effort. And he goes and works on some other stuff. He might be working on 150 different things at one time, I don't know. And he comes back around to that and realizes, you know what, 50 pounds of pressure is still too much. How do I find a way to do it with 25 pounds of pressure? So he'll look at it and say, well, the last time I moved my pinky, but what if I move my other pinky? All of a sudden, 25 pounds of pressure. Because his goal is to make it to where the leverage aspect is so profound that a child can do a technique that a man can do and it'll be just as effective. One time that really brought that up to me was when I was still at the Gracie Academy. So I was, uh, that was when Horian, Horian and Hoyce were running the academy. And Hidon Gracie, who was about 12 or 13 at the time, he was uh, still an orange belt, I think it was, and Horian was demonstrating chokes to the class and he had Hidon with him. And he pulled one of the adults aside, a big guy, and he says, the choke is not strength, right? You know, you guys, they're just kind of like grabbing the neck and you're like, eh, and you're eh, shoving that head into it. He said, that's not really the way to do it. You need to have somebody who's small be able to choke somebody who's big. So he called Hidon over and said, Hidon, go ahead and set the rear naked choke up. So Hidon just went and did the rear naked choke and he just squeezed that guy and the guy tapped and said, told, you know, Hori and asked the guy, how did it feel? He goes, that was tight, that was really good. And he says, you see, if a, if, a, if a boy can do it on a man, then that's a good technique. Well, now if let's look at, let, how would Hickson look at it? Well, Hickson, maybe Horian does too, but Hickson would look at it 
and I'm assuming here, but this is the way that I interpret things. If a 12 or 13 year old boy could choke out this man, how would we get a six year old girl to do it? Not even a boy, a girl who's six years old. Well, it could be a six year old boy because a lot of times six year old girls are stronger than six year old boys, right? Uh, but anyway, a six year old, the, the, the type of strength that they have, how would we hone the technique such that this six year old could do it? A lot of people who are practitioners don't think in those terms. It takes a true innovator to think in those terms and it's the innovator who makes the martial art better than when they came into it because other people will benefit from that. You never know. You know, let's say we get Hickson gets it down to the point where it's, it's 25 pounds of pressure. But by him showing that to somebody, that somebody may have figured out a way to get it down to 10 pounds of pressure. That person is truly an innovator. The other person who is not an innovator will take that 25 pounds of pressure and take it all the way and win and beat everybody with it. But they're still using 25 pounds of pressure. Here's an example. Here's, here's a, a good example of an innovator, Dean Lister. Dean Lister, who knew about leg locks and foot locks and all that kind of stuff, you know, he, he learned about it from, I don't know who he learned it from, but figured, you know what? It will help my jujitsu if I bring it in. So he did. He brought it in and by him bringing it in and working on it, he opened the eyes of many people, including one John Danaher, right? I've never met him. One day I hope to. But he's, he's the, the evil genius behind Henzo Gracie's uh, fighters now who can just tear people up, you know, just going for their legs. And, and, and it all started with that, that one concept of locking the leg down, which, you know, the, the Japanese judo term is called the ashigurami. But John Danaher, whose body is just broken. I mean, he, he's had all kinds of injuries and, and, and he's had, had all kinds of physical issues, but his mind is such that he's an innovator in jujitsu. You cannot compare an innovator to a technician or yeah, a technician, somebody who's very good with technical expertise in doing things and, and can execute it because oftentimes that technician was taught by an innovator. And if not for the innovator, that technician would not be anywhere. Right? There's also innovations in teaching. Right? Look at the way uh, Hiron and Henry Gracie are changing the way jiu-jitsu is being taught. It's always been done one-on-one, -on -one, but in an environment where you cannot have an instructor physically present, a black belt instructor physically present at every place. Right? A lot of people ask me, Ryan Young, when are you going to do a Kama Jiu-Jitsu studio near me? Well, where are you? And it's some place that we're obviously not in. Um, or it could be, I have to have a blue belt instructor because there are no black belts in my area. I live in a relatively remote area, remote for jujitsu, and there are no black belts here, so I need to learn under a blue belt. Hiron and Henner Gracie have innovated the way the delivery of Gracie jujitsu happens. A lot of people would hate on them saying, well, you know, you can't be learning online and all that. And well, yes, I mean, learning online is certainly not optimal. It's much better to have a black belt instructor and a good black belt instructor guiding you through the journey every step of the way. So they're, they're just doing what they think will spread the word of Gracie Jiu-Jitsu. And when you really think about it, you do a lot of learning remotely. You don't learn everything with the guidance of your teacher there all the time. It's always the best solution, right? And even you know, having a mentor teach you one-on-one -on -one is even better than being in a class with that same mentor. But for people who don't have any access to the Gracie Jiu Jitsu system, you know, the, the, the self-defense system that we do and that they do as well, uh, who people, people don't have any access to it, sometimes the online way is really the only way. And you, you just find some people to practice with and you do your best. But that's an innovation. Prior, you know, when I learned, there was no such thing as online learning. There weren't even uh, VHS tapes yet that showed Jiu Jitsu. There was just Gracie in action. Gracie in Action 2, that was it. Um, and, and actually Gracie in Action 2, I think, came after I had started. But if you wanted to learn, you had to physically move yourself. Thankfully, I was in Hawaii and I had house in there, but when I wanted to go to the Gracie Academy, I wanted to train under Hickson, I had to move to California to do that. A lot of people don't have that ability or that option or that inclination to make that move. So the next best thing would be to learn under someone else, another instructor who may move to your area. not a Gracie family member, but the next best thing. Okay, well, what happens when you don't have a black belt to learn under? Then you have to look for a brown, purple, blue belt to learn under. 
and it's a less and less and less desirable situation with each step down. Well, what would you, would you put on, a, on the same, I guess on the same level, learning from a black belt, a very good black belt, a very good black belt instructor learning remotely? Where would you put that versus learning one-on-one -on -one with a blue belt? Or even a purple belt? It's hard to say. But if not for the innovations of Hiron and Henry Gracie, we wouldn't have the whole potential for someone to learn online, right? And I've met people who've come through the Gracie Certified Training Centers, which were not run necessarily by black belts. In fact, I'm, no, they weren't run by black belts. But they do have a, a knowledge, a knowledge base that, that ordinary people on the street don't have. And I know it definitely helped them. So in this whole argument about who's better, don't necessarily look at about it in, 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 in the same terms as who's better. You know, the person who beats this person is better than the other person. You have to look at the person on an apples to apples comparison, right? You cannot compare an innovator to a plain technician or a brawler because it's all different. You have to look at an innovator versus another innovator and make sure the innovations are the same. And that's the best way to kind of compare things and, and make your determination of who is better in the art. Anyway, that's all I got. Take care. Happy training. Bye-bye now.